Thank you, Alicia, that was fabulous. Um, as we've learned today, climate change is here now, and it's going to get worse, and the choices that we make determine how much worse it's going to get. One of the things that we can do personally is to start to electrify everything in our homes. Uh, you could see that if you get an electric vehicle, it lowers your emissions. But that electric vehicle's emissions are quite a bit lower if we power it with renewable energy and if we switch our grid to renewable energy. So right now, we know very clearly that climate change is mostly caused by humans burning fossil fuels. And to, to slow that, we need to transition to renewable energy. I'm really excited our next speaker, Kara Choquette, is going to talk about change as opportunity, how new wind energy development can benefit Wyoming. And Kara has been working for 13 years. She's been working for the Anschutz Corporation, and they are trying to develop uh, two new large renewable energy projects. One is a large wind project, and the other is a large uh, transmission project to connect the West. And Kara also was recently nominated by Governor Mark Gordon to serve on the Wyoming Energy Authority Board. And this is a pretty exciting advancement to have a wind energy supporter on the board. So we're really pleased to have you here today, Kara. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, and thank you to the Lander Climate Action Network for inviting me to talk about our projects. They're really unusual projects um, for Wyoming and really for the nation. Um, but I figured you all were supporters of renewable energy when I saw that very cool logo. Basically, I think that's bison top, solar, and wind. So congratulations on your awesome logo. Um, before I start, I really wanted to just give a little bit of grounding about what wind energy is existing in Wyoming right now, and where is it, just if you don't know. And I mean, I think we've talked a lot today about the, um, what is renewable wind energy, and it's essentially turning the wind into electricity. Wyoming, um, according to the American Clean Power Association, has really grown in the amount of installed wind capacity. It's doubled in the past couple of years. A lot of that growth is thanks to Rocky Mountain Power, Black Hills Energy, and then there's one independent power project that went into service in 2020. Um, so it's great to see that Wyoming is now number 14 among all states in installed wind power capacity. Um, it's, it's really reflective of those new projects went into service in 2019 and 2020, and some of it in 2021, um, thanks to COVID and some repowering activity. But until that time, there was essentially one other wind power project that went into service from 2010 until 2020. Uh, so this is really great progress for Wyoming. I don't know how well you can see this map, but um, in terms of equipping people with tools, this is a great website that's put together by um, the US Geological Survey, the American Clean Power Association, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So if you can see the outline of Wyoming, where are the wind projects today in Wyoming? By and large, they're located alongside existing infrastructure. They're located along I-25, they're located along I-80, and a little bit of, uh, along Highway 30. And a lot of that has to do with transmission. So you talk about history. <laughs> a lot of the interstates are where there were trails, uh, whereas there's also transmission, and that's a really key component for um, new, wind new wind power projects is to have access to transmission and to get on the grid. So um, as Greg mentioned, the projects that we're working on are two really big projects. I think Ariel started off our day talking about the importance of solutions um, that are swift and at scale. Uh, I can't help you with the swift part, <laughs> but we can certainly um, help address the scale part. So the um, Chuck Cherry and Sierra Madre Wind Energy Project is set to be the largest single wind power project in the country, if um, not North America and potentially the world. Um, at the same time, we're developing, again, our nation has not seen investments in large transmission infrastructure. And the TransWest Express Transmission Project, as you'll see, is really critical electric infrastructure designed to better connect the West and also open up Wyoming to new energy markets it is not serving today. So our projects are really specifically targeted at renewable energy markets in California, Arizona, and Nevada. This map is the 2010 census data showing the population of Wyoming as compared to, say, the population of California, as well as the renewable portfolio standards. 
Wyoming doesn't have any renewable portfolio standards. And it simply just doesn't have enough electricity load to need the amount of electricity that a project like ours can provide. But Wyoming is very blessed amongst all of its energy resources to have a tremendous wind energy resource. So this is a map that um, essentially was put together by a wind resource consultant, AWS True Power. They do a lot of work for the National Renewable Energy Lab. And you can see in the western US, and by the way, we're all connected in one grid, essentially from Nebraska to California and even a little bit of Canada and Mexico. So Wyoming, along with eastern New Mexico, has this dark red area is the best onshore wind energy resource in the United States. So as a company, we're a resource company, we look at, well, Wyoming has a great uh, wind energy or wind resource supply. There's a market in the desert southwest that needs more renewable energy supplies. And it's not something that Wyoming wants. How do we connect and supply and demand and put those pieces of the puzzle together? But first, I'll talk a little bit about what is the Choke Cherry and Sierra Madre Wind Project. So again, I hope you can see this. I think it's always best to explain the project with maps. Um, the green outline is the boundaries of the Overland Trail Cattle Company Ranch, which is owned and operated by the Anschutz Corporation as a separate facility. It's a cattle ranch. It'll continue to be a working cattle ranch. But it also has some of the best, as I said, wind resources in the country. So the green squares are the private lands. Um, the yellow squares are BLM lands. And so when, back in 2008, <laughs> when the company was seeing, you know, as a resource company, as a company that's very responsive to markets and looking for, you know, evolution in various industries, um, at the time, the federal government was very keen, um, and even Congress passed through the Energy Policy Act of 2005, that Congress wanted to see 10,000 megawatts of renewable energy on federal land within the next 10 years, or 2015. So we as the private landowner who were interested in developing wind energy thought, well, we can partner with, essentially, partner with the BLM, the federal government, and let's do a wind project at scale. Let's do a wind project that's utility scale, takes advantage of all the resources, and thus the Ch Cherry and Sierra Madre Wind Energy Project began with uh, filing our first right-of-way application with the BLM in January of 2008. Uh, to start the development and permitting for this project. So the dots that you see there are indicating the approximately 600 wind turbines we'll have located on the site that together will provide over 3,000 megawatts of nameplate capacity. This would be the largest power plant by capacity in Wyoming, and it's all wind energy. Uh, as further context, Hoover Dam has a nameplate capacity of about 2,080 megawatts. So this is significantly larger in capacity and actually in electricity output as Hoover Dam. Um, this would be about a $5 billion investment in Wyoming energy infrastructure. And you know, Wyoming really is seeking to diversify and expand its energy economy. This is a project that will significantly add um, to Wyoming's non-mineral uh, tax-based non-mineral production in Wyoming. Um, the top has the city of Rollins, so like a lot of the other wind projects you see in, in Wyoming, we're right next to the interstate, <laughs> or just south of Interstate 80. Any of you who have driven by there know this is an incredibly windy place. Um, <laughs> I was really struck by the comments about the importance of indigenous knowledge and local knowledge. We ended up putting up 32 different meteorological towers, or MET towers, to test the wind resource figure out, you know, where is the best wind, at what time of the year does it blow, what time of the day. And all the people in Rollins are like, we could have told you it's always windy from the west and southwest. <laughs> and the data did verify, the scientific data did verify, it is always windy from the west and southwest. So all of these dots really represent years of environmental analysis and data. Um, we've gone through... Um, well, and I'll talk a little bit about the next slide. We've gone through um, years of uh, environmental impact statement process, again, tapping that local knowledge through the public um, outreach components of the EIS process, which is very good. Um, and then the TransWest Express project also has gone through similar levels of environmental review. So this is the second project we're working on. I'll kind of focus more on wind, but this is really important for Wyoming. This is critical new infrastructure that will connect Wyoming so you see on the map, the gray bars are indicative of the existing transmission capacity today. 
So you can see there's quite a bit of transmission capacity along the west coast. There's not so much transmission capacity connecting us east to west across the entire western power grid. And there's nothing that really directly connects Wyoming to the desert southwest electricity markets. Rocky Mountain Power uh, is, is the biggest owner and operator, biggest purchaser of wind power in Wyoming, but their service territory is Wyoming up to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, Black Hills Energy is kind of Colorado, um, parts of South Dakota, Nebraska. Basin Electric is also Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, part of Wyoming. We have no access, and TransWest will help provide that access, not only for wind energy today, which is what the market wants. So there's a huge demand for renewable energy, as you saw in the desert southwest. But transmission is a very long-life asset. So what are the energy resources that Wyoming may have in the future? Maybe it will be small modular nuclear reactors in 30 years. Whatever that is, we need the transmission or the connectivity or the pipeline, if you will, to help connect us to those new places. So I'll just step back again and talk about environmental review. I think, um, I bet any of you a steak at Lander's Finest Restaurant, <laughs> that this project has gone through more environmental review than any other project in the country because of our placement on BLM lands. The vast majority of wind power projects in the country are not located on federal land. Only about 1.2% of all wind capacity is on federal land. But when you are on federal land, it triggers an entirely new level of environmental review, analysis, we say every resource has been looked at from the soil to the sky, everything in between. Everything has been considered, and the placement of every single dot and every single turbine is respecting that environmental data that's been examined and gathered. One thing I wanted to particularly talk about is the hard work that we've gone through to help protect and enhance eagle populations in Wyoming. You know, I think it's, a, it's definitely an issue that is worthy of attention and concern, and we're very proud that we went through the work in partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to get what's called at the time eagle take permits and now incidental take permits. And what it requires to get those permits is a very, very, very high level of conservation planning and work to make sure that you have done everything in your power as a wind developer to first avoid and minimize potential impacts to avian populations. And what does that mean? That means years of site characterization across the site. We've had biologists, so we have human observers that are going across the site doing all sorts of raptor surveys for multiple years. We also had an avian radar deployed on the site so we can tell exactly what habitat, what airspace do the birds use? When do they use that airspace? How high are the migratory populations flying? And let's use all of that data then to site turbines smart from the start. Uh, we discovered in our data collection, for example, there are areas where we should not put a wind turbine. We have thousands of acres of the ranch that are off limits to wind that we very not creatively called turbine no-build zones. <laughs> So all of that work goes into your work with the Fish and Wildlife Service to prove that you've done everything possible. And then the Fish and Wildlife Service will say, look, you've done everything to avoid accidental take of an eagle. And take does not necessarily mean mortality. It could just mean disturb. Um, but then you still mitigate. So we still mitigate for those potential impacts to golden eagles and bald eagles. And that is through a plan called power pole retrofitting, where we're going out and we're doing that work now to pay to retrofit existing power poles that were built before the electric power industry knew how, um, you know, the potential risk that, it, that power lines could pose to uh, a, uh, raptors and other species. We're paying to retrofit and improve those power lines now. So the idea is that you're growing eagles or you're making sure there's a robust population such that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service determined that our project will actually have a net benefit to golden eagles because we're doing work that otherwise would not have been done. Of course, I have to talk about emissions. <laughs> That's clearly one of the biggest benefits of wind energy is that you can generate electricity without also ongoing emissions. And this is a quote that I really spoke to me back in 2009 in Time Magazine that um, climate change could undermine the conservation work of whole generations. It turns out you can't save species without saving the sky. 
And through the environmental impact statement work of the BLM, separate EIS processes for the wind project and the transmission line project, if TransWest were not built, we are, GHG emissions on the order of millions of tons of CO2 potentially would not be avoided. We think our wind power project, depending on our final capacity, will help avoid 7 to 11 million tons of uh, greenhouse gas emissions every year. That's a huge environmental benefit of wind energy. Another benefit, of course, is we're creating new jobs in Wyoming. Our wind power project, because of the market we're targeting, doesn't compete with Powder River Basin Coal, but we are employing workers. Eric Diggs from Gillette is working on our project now as an operator, helping build the roads and the turbine pads and all the work that we've been doing since 2016. Uh, a shout out to Phil Cornella of the operating engineers who I think is here. The operating engineers is a partner with us on the project. And so we're providing good jobs on the project. Uh, we have people from Fremont County that are coming to Carbon County and working on the project to build the roads and turbine pads that are underway right now on the project. These are uh, great jobs for these operators, many of whom are otherwise going to other states to work on projects, and they really appreciate the value of being able to stay and work in Wyoming. So if anybody wants to become an operator, um, contact the uh, International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 800 out of Casper. They can tell you all about their great um, earn and learn program. And then once our project is in operation, we will be employing a whole lot of wind turbine technicians. This is the latest data I could find from the Wyoming Workforce Report. A mean wage is $55,000 a year. That's really great in Carbon County. Um, I didn't highlight it, but electrical power line installers and repairers, the mean wage is almost $86,000. These will be really good jobs for people in Carbon County. And again, there's opportunities to learn how to be a wind turbine technician in Wyoming. Um, Western Wyoming Community College has a lineman program that's available and they partner with Carbon County Higher Education Center. Carbon County Higher Ed says that they teach a lot of the skills that you need now to be a, a wind turbine technician. It's basically what they say is a mechanic in the sky. And Laramie County Community College also has a great wind turbine technician program, including a certificate program where people can be retrained to be a wind turbine technician in as little as 10 months. And then, of course, these are power plants. Power plants historically have been a great asset to a lot of communities across Wyoming, and this project will be no different. We will be, we anticipate, one of the largest property taxpayers, and this is what the BLM project projects as well, in all of Carbon County. So we think over the course of, say, construction, we're already paying property taxes now, even under construction, and have no revenue, and no customers yet, by the way, that's another way our project is really different. Um, <laughs> we expect to pay over $406 million in property taxes. Property taxes are a huge source of revenue for schools. If you've looked at your property tax bill, about two thirds or about three quarters of that goes to fund Wyoming schools. So Carbon County could easily find itself being a recapture county again because of the money that we'll pay in property taxes. In 2009, the legislature removed the exemption that had been in place on renewable energy equipment. So there used to be an exemption on the sale of, of, of wind turbines and solar panels. That exemption was removed. So as of 2011, all of these new wind power projects are paying sales taxes. In Carbon County, it's a 6% sales tax. That's another $232 million that will go to not only the state general fund, but to Carbon County, and very importantly, to incorporated municipalities within the county. So the sales tax is an important source of revenue for the county, for the municipality, and for the state. And then in 2010, the legislature added a tax just on the production of electricity generated by wind resources. Um, that, takes three year, that takes effect three years after a turbine has been installed. And that adds another approximately $208 million. So, we expect to pay around $850 million. This, again, will be one of the largest non-mineral taxpayers for the state of Wyoming. And then, of course, TransWest is paying sales taxes and property taxes as well. So this, again, um, will be a huge economic uplift for the state. I think it's hard to understand how important that is. So just a few slides trying to provide some context. This is the list of the state's 
top 25 state assessed taxpayers in 2018. Rocky Mountain Power was the biggest at $262 million. It's well over 300 million by now with the new plants that they've added. Um, those are the top of the world wind energy, one of the state's largest taxpayers. Three Buttes, Pioneer Wind Park, Mountain Wind. Mountain Wind was built in like 1998 and still as of 2018, it was one of the state's top 25 state assessed taxpayers. So it gives you a sense of how big these investments are relative to property tax contributions. And if our project existed, just doing a straight, let's look at fair market value guess, our project would be the largest such taxpayer if it had existed in 2019. This is an attempt to help show you a little bit the impact of sales and use taxes. This is reports from the uh, Wyoming Economic Analysis Division, October 2019, November, December, or January. These are huge increases for Carbon County from up to 16% year over year to almost 50%. That's reflective not only of our work that's ongoing, kind of low base load right now until we do the turbines, but Rocky Mountain Power at that time was buying and installing wind turbines in Carbon County. Huge uplift for the local communities. Um, the higher education director said to um, High Country News, everyone, else's, everyone else around here's hair is on fire, but we're sitting in a pretty good position thanks to wind energy. And then this is kind of, again, a little more context about the electricity tax um, that wind turbines pay. So over the past roughly 10 years that that tax has been implemented, the state of Wyoming has gotten additional, well, state and counties, $40 million. I mean, so when you see a wind turbine spinning in Wyoming, that is spending, spending money for your state general fund, which goes to support citizen services across the state. It's going to these counties. There's only six counties that have wind uh, projects in Wyoming today. That's how much they've added, that they've earned collectively over that time. In Carbon County last year, because of the way that the wind generation tax is allocated, they actually got more money back than they paid in. <laughs> and the wind turbines in Carbon County were each paying, this is just the generation tax, not counting the property tax. Each were paying over $5,000 per turbine in electricity tax. And according to the state of Wyoming, the average Wyoming household of three people owning a house of a certain size, I don't remember all the data, but it's roughly $3,200 that are paid by the average Wyoming resident. So each turbine is paying well over that just in the generation tax. Um, I was trying to really focus on benefits to Wyoming, but I feel like I also had just mentioned a little bit, this also because of our location on federal lands, aligns with and furthers the goal of the federal government. As I said, the 2005 Energy Policy Act calls for more renewables on federal land. The Energy Act of 2020 actually increased that goal to 25 gigawatts by 2025. Um, wind energy also is a very efficient land use. We're using less than 1% of the ranch. The total uh, long-term surface use will be less than 1% of the ranch. And that goes back to how careful we are in designing the project reclaiming everything we can so that we're only using the surface that we need for the life of the project. So very, very efficient land use. And one other thing, I, I kind of just added it here as a summary point, but given our discussion that we've had today about water, it's really important. And I, I, I mean, there's a lot of benefits to wind energy. That was just one I didn't focus on until kind of hearing the conversations today. But wind energy requires no water for ongoing electric generation. That's a huge benefit because otherwise most of our power plant technology, no matter if you're using nuclear or coal or natural gas, you're boiling water to make steam to turn a turbine. We need to be looking at more sources of electricity that come from ways that don't depend on water. So our project and operation, we'll use some water for uh, dust suppression on the roads and our operation center for the kitchen and the bathroom and that sort of thing. We estimate it's about 50 acre feet a year. If you look at some reports available from the state of Wyoming uh, water engineer website, and this was as of 2000, so it's maybe a little dated, but the two coal power plants in Southwest Wyoming were using on the order of 47,000 acre feet of water every year for power plant cooling. So again, a benefit of wind is not the reliance on water to create power. And in these times, <laughs> in this environment, and certainly in a place where we're looking to provide electricity to a market that needs it, leaving the jobs and the tax revenues back here in Wyoming, you know, those are states that also need to look at diversifying their electricity supplies. 
A lot of those states are relying on hydropower, which if you've seen any stories about the Colorado River, Hoover Dam, their hydropower supplies are dwindling. And so one of the value propositions that we offer, suggest to this market is, again, looking at diversifying your energy sources, not only um, geographic diversity, time of day diversity, technology diversity, but water diversity. This is, a, again, a technology that doesn't rely on water. Just a few more points to make, and again, this tying back to community. Carbon County is the home of Wyoming's first coal mining community. The town of Carbon was founded in 1868. The coal business moved on to Hanna, and after the passage of the Clean Air Act, all that business went up to Gillette. But Carbon County is historically Wyoming's coal county. And now, it is home to two-thirds of all of the existing and under construction, that's us, uh, under construction, wind power in Wyoming, according to the American Clean Power Association. And I can't tell you from my years of working in Carbon County what a huge honor it was when last year, Carbon County had a contest to develop its own county seal. They never had one before. The design contest was only open to residents of Carbon County. I think it was three of the five winning design featured wind turbines, and so did the final design showing how they see wind as an important part of their county identity and part of the resource mix they have to offer from the county. The Carbon County Visitor Council, I don't know if you can see it, they added little wind turbines <laughs> on the mountain. And when the community celebrated their 150th anniversary, they chose to incorporate images of wind turbines as in Union Pacific as part of the kind of past, present, and future of their community. And again, in the city of Rollins, one more plug for Rollins. Um, they have an annual festival called Summerfest. This year, they chose to make their Summerfest theme all about wind. So the theme is blown away in Rollins. A lot of the activities uh, have to do with wind energy. Of course, when I saw that, Power Company Wyoming had to sponsor this activity. Um, they have kites that a local artist has made. So someone had talked earlier about how you incorporate art into these discussions. They made um, customized kites for all the businesses in downtown and they're going to have a kite contest. So if you happen to be going through Rollins on July 8th or 9th, I would encourage you to stop by. And also just tying back to communities, you know, I think, you know, the reality is a community like Rollins may not do some of the things that, you know, say Jackson has done, but their contribution is they're supporting a huge wind power project as their neighbor, as their taxpayer, as a, as a corporate partner in their community. And I think that deserves a lot of recognition as well. So that's kind of my quick remarks. I don't know if there's time for Q&A or, Okay, but I'm sticking around, so if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. And again, just really appreciate the opportunity to talk here today and be invited to be part of this great inaugural event.